Books on Tape presents Absalom, Absalom by William Faulkner Read by Grover Gardner Chapter 1 From a little after two o'clock until almost sundown of the long, still, hot, weary, dead September afternoon, they sat in what Miss Coldfield still called the office, because her father had called it that. A dim, hot, airless room with the blinds all closed and fastened for forty-three summers, because when she was a girl someone had believed that light and moving air carried heat, and that dark was always cooler, and which, as the sun shone fuller and fuller on that side of the house, became latticed with yellow slashes full of dust motes, which Quentin thought of as being flecks of the dead old dried paint itself blown inward from the scaling blinds, as wind might have blown them. There was a wisteria vine blooming for the second time that summer on a wooden trellis before one window, into which sparrows came now and then in random gusts, making a dry, vivid, dusty sound before going away. And opposite Quentin, Miss Coldfield, in the eternal black, which she had worn for forty-three years now, whether for sister, father, or not husband, none knew, sitting so bolt upright in the straight hard chair that was so tall for her that her legs hung straight and rigid as if she had iron shin-bones and ankles, clear of the floor with that air of impotent and static rage like children's feet, and talking in that grim, haggard, amazed voice until at last listening would renege and hearing sense self-confound, and the long-dead object of her impotent yet indomitable frustration would appear, as though by outraged recapitulation evoked, quiet, inattentive, and harmless, out of the biding and dreamy and victorious dust. Her voice would not cease, it would just vanish. There would be the dim coffin-smelling gloom, sweet and oversweet, with the twice-bloomed wisteria against the outer wall by the savage, quiet September sun impacted, distilled, and hyper-distilled, into which came now and then the loud, cloudy flutter of the sparrows like a flat limber stick whipped by an idle boy and the rank smell of female old flesh long embattled in virginity, while the wan, haggard face watched him above the faint triangle of lace at wrists and throat from the too tall chair in which she resembled a crucified child. And the voice not ceasing, but vanishing into and then out of the long intervals like a stream, a trickle running from patch to patch of dried sand. And the ghost mused with shadowy docility as if it were the voice which he haunted, where a more fortunate one would have had a house. Out of quiet thunderclap he would abrupt, man, horse, demon, upon a scene peaceful and decorous as a school prize watercolor, faint sulphur reek still in hair, clothes, and beard, with grouped behind him his band of wild niggers like beasts half tamed to walk upright like men, in attitudes wild and reposed and manacled among them the French architect with his air grim, haggard, and tataran. Immobile, bearded, and hand, palm lifted, the horseman sat. Behind him the wild blacks and the captive architect huddled quietly, carrying in bloodless paradox the shovels and picks and axes of peaceful conquest. Then in the long unamaze Quentin seemed to watch them overrun suddenly the hundred square miles of tranquil and astonished earth, and drag house and formal gardens violently out of the soundless nothing, and clap them down like cards upon a table beneath the up-palm, immobile and pontific, creating the Sutpens Hundred, the B Sutpens Hundred, like the olden-time B Light. Then hearing would reconcile, and he would seem to listen to two separate Quentins now. The Quentin Compson preparing for Harvard in the South, the Deep South, dead since 1865, and peopled with garrulous, outraged, baffled ghosts, listening, having to listen, to one of the ghosts which had refused to lie still even longer than most had, telling him about old ghost times. And the Quentin Compson who was still too young to deserve yet to be a ghost, but nevertheless having to be one for all that, since he was born and bred in the Deep South the same as she was the two separate Quentins now talking to one another in the long silence of not-people in not-language, like this. It seems that this demon, his name was Sutpen, Colonel Sutpen, Colonel Sutpen, who came out of nowhere and without warning upon the land with a band of strange niggers and built a plantation, tore violently a plantation, Miss Rosa Coldfield says, tore violently, and married her sister Ellen and begot a son and a daughter which— without gentleness begot, Miss Rosa Coldfield says. 
without gentleness, which should have been the jewels of his pride and the shield and comfort of his old age only. Only they destroyed him or something, or he destroyed them or something, and died. And died. Without regret, Miss Rosa Coldfield says, saved by her. Yes, saved by her. And by Quentin Compson. Yes, and by Quentin Compson. Because you are going away to attend the college at Harvard, they tell me, she said. So I don't imagine you will ever come back here and settle down as a country lawyer in a little town like Jefferson, since northern people have already seen to it that there is little left in the South for a young man. So maybe you will enter the literary profession, as so many southern gentlemen and gentlewomen, too, are doing now, and maybe some day you will remember this and write about it. You will be married then, I expect, and perhaps your wife will want a new gown or a new chair for the house, and you can write this and submit it to the magazines. Perhaps you will even remember kindly then the old woman who made you spend a whole afternoon sitting indoors and listening while she talked about people and events you were fortunate enough to escape yourself when you wanted to be out among young friends of your own age. Yes, sir, Quentin said. Only she don't mean that, he thought. It's because she wants it told. It was still early then. He had yet in his pocket the note which he had received by the hand of a small negro boy just before noon, asking him to call and see her, the quaint, stiffly formal request which was actually a summons out of another world almost. The queer, archaic sheet of ancient good notepaper written over with the neat, faded, cramped script which, due to his astonishment at the request from a woman three times his age and whom he had known all his life without having exchanged a hundred words with her, or perhaps to the fact that he was only twenty years old, he did not recognize as revealing a character cold, implacable, and even ruthless. He obeyed it immediately after the noon meal, walking the half-mile between his home and hers through the dry, dusty heat of early September, and so into the house. It, too, somehow smaller than its actual size, it was of two stories, unpainted and a little shabby, yet with an air, a quality, of grim endurance, as though like her it had been created to fit into and complement a world in all ways a little smaller than the one in which it found itself. Where in the gloom of the shuttered hallway, whose air was even hotter than outside, as if there were prisoned in it like in a tomb all the suspiration of slow, heat-laden time which had recurred during the forty-three years, the small figure in black, which did not even rustle, the wan triangle of lace at wrists and throat, the dim face looking at him with an expression speculative, urgent, and intent, waited to invite him in. It's because she wants it told, he thought, so that people whom she will never see and whose names she will never hear, and who have never heard her name nor seen her face, will read it and know at last why God let us lose the war that only through the blood of our men and the tears of our women could he stay this demon and efface his name and lineage from the earth. Then, almost immediately, he decided that neither was this the reason why she had sent the note, and sending it, why to him, since, if she had merely wanted it told, written and even printed, she would not have needed to call in anybody, a woman who even in his, Quentin's, father's youth had already established, even if not affirmed, herself, as the town's and the county's poetess laureate, by issuing to the stern and meager subscription list of the county newspaper poems, ode, eulogy, and epitaph, out of some bitter and implacable reserve of undefeat, and these from a woman whose family's martial background, as both town and county knew, consisted of the father who, a conscientious objector on religious grounds, had starved to death in the attic of his own house, hidden, some said walled up, there, from Confederate provost marshal's men, and fed secretly at night by this same daughter, who at the very time was accumulating her first folio in which the lost causes unregenerate vanquished were name by name embalmed. And the nephew, who served for four years in the same company with his sister's fiancé, and then shot the fiancé to death before the gates to the house where the sister waited in her wedding gown on the eve of the wedding, and then fled, vanished none knew where. It would be three hours yet before he would learn why she had sent for him, because this part of it, this first part of it, Quentin already knew. It was a part of his twenty years' heritage of breathing the same air and hearing his father talk about the man, 
a part of the town's, Jefferson's, eighty years' heritage of the same air which the man himself had breathed between this September afternoon in 1909 and that Sunday morning in June 1833, when he first rode into town out of no discernible past and acquired his land, no one knew how, and built his house, his mansion, apparently out of nothing, and married Ellen Coldfield and begot his two children, the son who widowed the daughter who had not yet been a bride, and so accomplished his allotted course to its violent, Miss Coldfield at least would have said just, end. Quentin had grown up with that. The mere names were interchangeable and almost myriad. His childhood was full of them. His very body was an empty hall echoing with sonorous, defeated names. He was not a being, an entity. He was a commonwealth. He was a barracks filled with stubborn, back-looking ghosts still recovering, even forty-three years afterward, from the fever which had cured the disease, waking from the fever without even knowing that it had been the fever itself which they had fought against and not the sickness, looking with stubborn recalcitrance backward beyond the fever and into the disease with actual regret, weak from the fever yet free of the disease and not even aware that the freedom was that of impotence. But why tell me about it, he said to his father that evening, when he returned home after she had dismissed him at last with his promise to return for her in the buggy. Why tell me about it? What is it to me that the land or the earth or whatever it was got tired of him at last and turned and destroyed him? What if it did destroy her family, too? It's going to turn and destroy us all some day, whether our name happens to be Sutpen or Coldfield or not. Ah, Mr. Compson said. Years ago we in the South made our women into ladies. Then the war came and made the ladies into ghosts. So what else can we do, being gentlemen, but listen to them being ghosts? Then he said, Do you want to know the real reason why she chose you? They were sitting on the gallery after supper, waiting for the time Miss Coldfield had set for Quentin to call for her. It's because she will need someone to go with her, a man, a gentleman, yet one still young enough to do what she wants, do it the way she wants it done. And she chose you because your grandfather was the nearest thing to a friend which Sutpen ever had in this county, and she probably believes that Sutpen may have told your grandfather something about himself and her, about that engagement which did not engage, that truth which failed to plight. Might even have told your grandfather the reason why at the last she refused to marry him, and that your grandfather might have told me and I might have told you. And so, in a sense, the affair, no matter what happens out there tonight, will still be in the family, the skeleton, if it be a skeleton, still in the closet. She may believe that if it hadn't been for your grandfather's friendship, Sutpen could never have got a foothold here, and that if he had not got that foothold, he could not have married Ellen. So maybe she considers you partly responsible through heredity for what happened to her and her family through him." Whatever her reason for choosing him, whether it was that or not, the getting to it, Quentin thought, was taking a long time. Meanwhile, as though in inverse ratio to the vanishing voice, the invoked ghost of the man whom she could neither forgive nor revenge herself upon began to assume a quality almost of solidity, permanence. Itself circumambient and enclosed by its effluvium of hell, its aura of unregeneration, it mused, Mused thought seemed to possess sentience as if, though dispossessed of the peace, who was impervious anyhow to fatigue, which she declined to give it, it was still irrevocably outside the scope of her hurt or harm. With that quality peaceful and now harmless and not even very attentive, the ogre shape which, as Miss Coldfield's voice went on, resolved out of itself before Quentin's eyes the two half-ogre children— the three of them forming a shadowy background for the fourth one. This was the mother, the dead sister Ellen, this Niobe without tears, who had conceived to the demon in a kind of nightmare, who even while alive had moved but without life and grieved but without weeping, who now had an air of tranquil and unwitting desolation, not as if she had either outlived the others or had died first, but as if she had never lived at all. Quentin seemed to see them, the four of them arranged into the conventional family group of the period, with formal and lifeless decorum, and seen now as the fading and ancient photograph itself would have been seen, enlarged and hung on the wall behind and above the voice, and of whose presence there the voice's owner was not even aware. 
as if she, Miss Coldfield, had never seen this room before, a picture, a group, which even to Quentin had a quality strange, contradictory, and bizarre, not quite comprehensible, not, even to twenty, quite right, a group the last member of which had been dead twenty-five years and the first fifty, evoked now out of the airless gloom of a dead house between an old woman's grim and implacable unforgiving and the passive chafing of a youth of twenty, telling himself even amid the voice, Maybe you have to know anybody awful well to love them, but when you have hated somebody for forty-three years you will know them awful well, so maybe it's better than maybe it's fine then, because after forty-three years they can't any longer surprise you or make you either very contented or very mad. And maybe it, the voice, the talking, the incredulous and unbearable amazement, had even been a cry aloud once, Quentin thought, long ago when she was a girl, of young and indomitable unregret, of indictment of blind circumstance and savage event. But not now. Now only the lonely, thwarted old female flesh embattled for forty-three years in the old insult, the old unforgiving outraged and betrayed by the final and complete affront which was Sutpen's death. He wasn't a gentleman. He wasn't even a gentleman. He came here with a horse and two pistols, and a name which nobody ever heard before, knew for certain was his own any more than the horse was his own, or even the pistols, seeking some place to hide himself, and Yachnipatawpha County supplied him with it. He sought the guarantee of reputable men to barricade him from the other and later strangers who might come seeking him in turn, and Jefferson gave him that. Then he needed respectability, the shield of a virtuous woman, to make his position impregnable even against the men who had given him protection on that inevitable day and hour when even they must rise against him in scorn and horror and outrage. And it was mine and Ellen's father who gave him that. Oh, I hold no brief for Ellen, blind romantic fool who had only youth and inexperience to excuse her even if that— blind romantic fool, then later blind woman mother fool, when she no longer had either youth or inexperience to excuse her, when she lay dying in that house for which she had exchanged pride and peace both, and nobody there but the daughter who was already the same as a widow without ever having been a bride, and was three years later to be a widow sure enough without having been anything at all, and the son who had repudiated the very roof under which he had been born, and to which he would return but once more before disappearing for good, and that as a murderer and almost a fratricide. And he, fiend, blackguard, and devil, in Virginia fighting, where the chances of the earth's being rid of him were the best anywhere under the sun, yet Ellen and I both knowing that he would return, that every man in our armies would have to fall before bullet or ball found him. And only I, a child, a child, mind you, four years younger than the very niece I was asked to save, for Ellen to turn to and say, Protect her, protect Judith at least. Yes, blind romantic fool, who did not even have that hundred miles of plantation which apparently moved our father, nor that big house and the notion of slaves underfoot day and night which reconciled, I won't say moved, her aunt. No, just the face of a man who contrived somehow to swagger even on a horse. A man who so far as anyone, including the father who was to give him a daughter in marriage, knew either had no past at all or did not dare reveal it. A man who rode into town out of nowhere with a horse and two pistols and a herd of wild beasts that he had hunted down single-handed because he was stronger in fear than even they were in whatever heathen place he had fled from and that French architect who looked like he had been hunted down and caught in turn by the Negroes. A man who fled here and hid, concealed himself behind respectability, behind that hundred miles of land which he took from a tribe of ignorant Indians, nobody knows how, and a house the size of a courthouse where he lived for three years without a window or door or bedstead in it, and still called it Sutpen's Hundred, as if it had been a king's grant in unbroken perpetuity from his great-grandfather. A home, position, a wife and family which, being necessary to concealment, he accepted along with the rest of respectability, as he would have accepted the necessary discomfort and even pain of the briars and thorns in a thicket if the thicket could have given him the protection he sought. No, not even a gentleman. 
Mary and Ellen or Mary and ten thousand Ellens could not have made him one. Not that he wanted to be one or even be taken for one. No, that was not necessary, since all he would need would be Ellen's and our father's names on a wedding license, or on any other patent of respectability that people could look at and read, just as he would have wanted our father's or any other reputable man's signature on a note of hand, because our father knew who his father was in Tennessee and who his grandfather had been in Virginia. And our neighbors and the people we lived among knew that we knew, and we knew they knew we knew and we knew that they would have believed us about who and where we came from even if we had lied, just as anyone could have looked at him once and known that he would be lying about who and where and why he came from by the very fact that apparently he had to refuse to say it all. And the very fact that he had had to choose respectability to hide behind was proof enough, if anyone needed further proof, that what he fled from must have been some opposite of respectability too dark to talk about because he was too young. He was just twenty-five, and a man of twenty-five does not voluntarily undertake the hardship and privation of clearing virgin land and establishing a plantation in a new country just for money. Not a young man without any past that he apparently cared to discuss in Mississippi in 1833, with a river full of steamboats loaded with drunken fools covered with diamonds and bent on throwing away their cotton and slaves before the boat reached New Orleans. Not with this just one night's hard ride away, and the only handicap or obstacle being the other blackguards, or the risk of being put ashore on a sandbar, and at the remotest a hemp rope. And he was no younger son sent out from some old quiet country like Virginia or Carolina with the surplus negroes to take up new land, because anyone could look at those negroes of his and tell that they may have come, and probably did, from a much older country than Virginia or Carolina, but it wasn't a quiet one. And anyone could have looked once at his face and known that he would have chosen the river, and even the certainty of the hemp rope, to undertake in what he undertook, even if he had known that he would find gold buried and waiting for him in the very land which he had bought. No, I hold no more brief for Ellen than I do for myself. I hold even less for myself, because I had had twenty years in which to watch him, where Ellen had had but five, and not even those five to see him, but only to hear at second hand what he was doing, and not even to hear more than half of that, since apparently half of what he actually did during those five years nobody at all knew about, and half of the remainder no man would have repeated to a wife, let alone a young girl. He came here and set up a rarey show which lasted five years, and Jefferson paid him for the entertainment by at least shielding him to the extent of not telling their women folks what he was doing. But I had had all my life to watch him in, since apparently, and for what reason heaven has not seen fit to divulge, my life was destined to end on an afternoon in April forty-three years ago since anyone who even had as little to call living as I had had up to that time would not call what I have had since living. I saw what had happened to Ellen, my sister. I saw her almost a recluse, watching those two doomed children growing up whom she was helpless to save. I saw the price which she had paid for that house and that pride. I saw the notes of hand on pride and contentment and peace and all to which she had put her signature when she walked into the church that night begin to fall due in succession. I saw Judith's marriage forbidden without rhyme or reason or shadow of excuse. I saw Ellen die with only me, a child, to turn to and ask to protect her remaining child. I saw Henry repudiate his home and birthright, and then return and practically fling the bloody corpse of his sister's sweetheart at the hem of her wedding gown. I saw that man return, the evil source and head which had outlasted all its victims, who had created two children not only to destroy one another and his own line, but my line as well. Yet I agreed to marry him. No, I hold no brief for myself. I don't plead youth, since what creature in the South since 1861, man, woman, nigger, or mule, had had time or opportunity not only to have been young, but to have heard what being young was like from those who had? I don't plead propinquity, the fact that I, 
a woman young and at the age for Marion, and in a time when most of the young men whom I would have known ordinarily were dead on lost battlefields, that I lived for two years under the same roof with him. I don't plead material necessity. The fact that, an orphan, a woman, and a pauper, I turned naturally not for protection but for actual food to my only kin, my dead sister's family. Though I defy anyone to blame me, an orphan of twenty, a young woman without resources, who should desire not only to justify her situation but to vindicate the honor of a family the good name of whose women has never been impugned, by accepting the honorable proffer of marriage from the man whose food she was forced to subsist on. And most of all, I do not plead myself, a young woman emerging from a holocaust which had taken parents, security, and all from her, who had seen all that living meant to her fall into ruins about the feet of a few figures with the shapes of men, but with the names and statures of heroes a young woman, I say, thrown into daily and hourly contact with one of these men who, despite what he might have been at one time, and despite what she might have believed or even known about him, had fought for four honorable years for the soil and traditions of the land where she had been born. And the man who had done that, villain died though he be, would have possessed in her eyes, even if only from association with them, the stature and shape of a hero too. And now he also emerging from the same holocaust in which she had suffered, with nothing to face what the future held for the South but his bare hands, and the sword which he at least had never surrendered, and the citation for valor from his defeated commander-in-chief. Oh, he was brave, I have never gainsaid that, but that our cause, our very life and future hopes and past pride, should have been thrown into the balance with men like that to buttress it. Men with valor and strength, but without pity or honor. Is it any wonder that heaven saw fit to let us lose? Nome, Quentin said. But that it should have been our father, mine and Ellen's father, of all of them that he knew, out of all the ones who used to go out there and drink and gamble with him and watch him fight those wild negroes, whose daughters he might even have won at cards, that it should have been our father. How he could have approached Papa, on what grounds, what there could have been beside the common civility of two men meeting on the street, between a man who came from nowhere or dared not to tell where, and our father, what there could have been between a man like that and Papa, a Methodist steward, a merchant who was not rich and who not only could have done nothing under the sun to advance his fortunes or prospects, but could by no stretch of the imagination even have owned anything that he would have wanted, even picked up in the road. A man who owned neither land nor slaves except two house servants, whom he had freed as soon as he got them, bought them, who neither drank nor hunted nor gambled. What there could have been between Papa and a man who, to my certain knowledge, was never in a Jefferson church but three times in his life, the once when he first saw Ellen, the once when they rehearsed the wedding, the once when they performed it, a man that anyone could look at and see that, even if he apparently had none now, he was accustomed to having money and intended to have it again and would have no scruples about how he got it. That man to discover Ellen inside a church. In church, mind you, as though there were a fatality and curse on our family, and God himself was seeing to it that it was performed and discharged to the last drop and dreg. Yes, fatality and curse on the South and on our family, as though because some ancestor of ours had elected to establish his descent in a land primed for fatality and already cursed with it, even if it had not rather been our family, our father's progenitors who had incurred the curse long years before and had been coerced by heaven into establishing itself in the land and the time already cursed. So that even I, a child still too young to know more than that, though Ellen was my own sister and Henry and Judith my own nephew and niece. I was not even to go out there, save when Papa or my aunt was with me, and that I was not to play with Henry and Judith at all except in the house. And not because I was four years younger than Judith and six years younger than Henry, wasn't it to me that Ellen turned before she died and said, Protect them? Even I used to wonder what our father or his father could have done before he married our mother— 
that Ellen and I would have to expiate, and neither of us alone be sufficient? What crime committed that would leave our family cursed to be instruments not only for that man's destruction, but for our own? Yes, am Quentin said. Yes, the grim, quiet voice said from beyond the unmoving triangle of dim lace. And now, among the musing and decorous wraiths, Quentin seemed to watch resolving the figure of a little girl, in prim skirts and pantalettes, the smooth, prim, decorous braids of the dead time. She seemed to stand, to lurk, behind the neat picket fence of a small, grimly middle-class yard or lawn, looking out upon the whatever ogre world of that quiet village street, with that air of children born too late into their parents' lives and doomed to contemplate all human behavior through the complex and needless follies of adults. An air Cassandra-like and humorless and profoundly and sternly prophetic out of all proportion to the actual years even of a child who had never been young. Because I was born too late. I was born twenty-two years too late. A child to whom out of the overheard talk of adults my own sister's and my sister's children's faces had come to be like the faces in an ogre tale between supper and bed, long before I was old enough or big enough to be permitted to play with them. Yet to whom that sister must have to turn at last when she lay dying, with one of the children vanished and doomed to be a murderer, and the other doomed to be a widow before she had even been a bride, and say, protect her at least— at least save Judith. A child, yet whose child's vouchsafed instinct could make that reply which the mature wisdom of her elders apparently could not make. Protect her? From whom and from what? He has already given them life. He does not need to harm them further. It is from themselves that they need protection. It should have been later than it was. It should have been late, yet the yellow slashes of moat palpitant sunlight were latticed no higher up the impalpable wall of gloom which separated them. The sun seemed hardly to have moved. It, the talking, the telling, seemed, to him, to Quentin, to partake of that logic and reason-flouting quality of a dream which the sleeper knows must have occurred, stillborn and complete, in a second. Yet the very quality upon which it must depend to move the dreamer— verisimilitude, to credulity, horror or pleasure or amazement, depends as completely upon a formal recognition of and acceptance of elapsed and yet elapsing time as music or a printed tale. Yes, I was born too late. I was a child who was to remember those three faces, and his too, as seen for the first time in the carriage on that first Sunday morning when this town finally realized that he had turned that road from Suppen's Hundred into the church, into a race track. I was three then, and doubtless I had seen them before, I must have, but I do not remember it. I do not even remember ever having seen Ellen before that Sunday. It was as though the sister whom I had never laid eyes on, who before I was born had vanished into the stronghold of an ogre or a djinn, was now to return through a dispensation of one day only to the world which she had quitted. And I, a child of three, waked early for the occasion, dressed and curled as if for Christmas, for an occasion more serious than Christmas even, since now and at last this ogre or djinn had agreed for the sake of the wife and the children to come to church, to permit them at least to approach the vicinity of salvation." to at least give Ellen one chance to struggle with him for those children's souls on a battleground where she could be supported not only by heaven but by her own family and people of her own kind. Yes, even for the moment submitting himself to redemption, or lacking that at least chivalrous for the instant, even though still unregenerate. That is what I expected. This is what I saw— as I stood there before the church between Papa and our aunt and waited for the carriage to arrive from the twelve-mile drive. And though I must have seen Ellen and the children before this, this is the vision of my first sight of them which I shall carry to my grave. A glimpse like the forefront of a tornado, of the carriage and Ellen's high white face within it, and the two replicas of his face in miniature flanking her— and on the front seat the face and teeth of the wild negro who was driving. And he, his face exactly like the negro's, save for the teeth, 
this because of his beard, doubtless, all in a thunder and a fury of wild-eyed horses and of galloping and of dust. Oh, there were plenty of them to abet him, assist him, make a race of it. Ten o'clock on Sunday morning, the carriage racing on two wheels up to the very door to the church with that wild negro in his Christian clothes looking exactly like a performing tiger in a linen duster and a top hat. And Ellen, with no drop of blood in her face, holding those two children who were not crying and who did not need to be held, who sat on either side of her perfectly still too, with in their faces that infantile enormity which we did not then quite comprehend. Oh, yes, there were plenty to aid and abet him. Even he could not have held a horse race without someone to race against. Because it was not even public opinion that stopped him, not even the men who might have had wives and children in carriages to be ridden down and into ditches. It was the minister himself, speaking in the name of the women of Jefferson and Yoknapatawpha County. So he quit coming to church himself. Now it would be just Ellen and the children in the carriage on Sunday morning. So we knew now that at least there would be no betting now, since no one could say if it was an actual race or not, since now, with his face absent, it was only the wild negro's perfectly inscrutable one with the teeth glinting a little, so that now we could never know if it were a race or a runaway, and if there was triumph it was on the face twelve miles back there at Supman's Hundred, which did not even require to see or be present. It was the negro now, who in the act of passing another carriage spoke to that team too as well as to his own. Something without words, not needing words probably, in that tongue in which they slept in the mud of that swamp and brought here out of whatever dark swamp he had found them in and brought them here. The dust, the thunder, the carriage whirling up to the church door while women and children scattered and screamed before it and men caught at the bridles of the other team and the negro would let Ellen and the children out at the door, and take the carriage on around to the hitchin grove, and beat the horses for running away. There was even a fool who tried to interfere once, whereupon the negro turned upon him with the stick lifted and his teeth showing a little, and said, Master, say, I do. You tell master. Yes, from them, from themselves. And this time it was not even the minister. It was Ellen. Our aunt and papa were talking, and I came in, and my aunt said, Go out and play, though even if I could not have heard through the door at all, I could have repeated the conversation for them. Your daughter, your own daughter, my aunt said, and papa, yes, she is my daughter. When she wants me to interfere, she will tell me so herself. Because this Sunday, when Ellen and the children came out of the front door, it was not the carriage waiting, it was Ellen's phaeton with the old gentle mare which she drove and the stable boy that he had bought instead of the wild negro. And Judith looked once at the phaeton and realized what it meant, and began to scream, screaming and kicking while they carried her back into the house and put her to bed. No, he was not present, nor do I claim a lurking triumphant face behind a window curtain. Probably he would have been as amazed as we were, since we would all realize now that we were faced by more than a child's tantrum or even hysteria. That his face had been in that carriage all the time, that it had been Judith, a girl of six, who had instigated and authorized that negro to make the team run away. Not Henry, mind, not the boy, which would have been outrageous enough, but Judith, the girl. As soon as Papa and I entered those gates that afternoon and began to go up the drive toward the house, I could feel it. It was as though somewhere in that Sunday afternoon's quiet and peace, the screams of that child still existed, lingered, not as sound now, but as something for the skin to hear, the hair on the head to hear. But I did not ask it once. I was just four then. I sat in the buggy beside Papa as I had stood between him and our aunt before the church on that first Sunday when I'd been dressed to come and see my sister and my nephew and niece for the first time, looking at the house. I had been inside it before, too, of course, but even when I saw it for the first time that I could remember, I seemed already to know how it was going to look, just as I seemed to know how Ellen and Judith and Henry would look before I saw them for the time which I always remember as being the first. No, not asking even then, but just looking at that huge, quiet house, saying, What room is Judith sick in, Papa? 
with that quiet aptitude of a child for accepting the inexplicable, though I now know that even then I was wondering what Judith saw when she came out the door and found the Phaeton instead of the carriage, the tame stable boy instead of the wild man. What she had seen in that Phaeton which looked so innocent to the rest of us, or worse, what she had missed when she saw the Phaeton and began to scream. Yes, a still, hot, quiet Sunday afternoon like this afternoon. I remember yet the utter quiet of that house when we went in, and from which I knew at once that he was absent, without knowing that he would now be in the Scuppernong Arbor drinking with Wash Jones. I only knew, as soon as Papa and I crossed the threshold, that he was not there. As though with some almost omniscient conviction, that same instinctive knowledge which enabled me to tell Ellen that it was not from him that Judith would need protection, knowing that he did not need to stay and observe his triumph, and that in comparison with what was to be, this one was a mere trivial business even beneath our notice, too. Yes, that quiet, darkened room with the blinds closed and a negro woman sitting beside the bed with a fan and Judith's white face on the pillow beneath a camphor cloth, asleep as I supposed then, Possibly it was sleep, or would be called sleep. And Ellen's face white and calm, and Papa said, Go out and find Henry and ask him to play with you, Rosa. And so I stood just outside that quiet door in that quiet upper hall, because I was afraid to go away even from it, because I could hear the Sabbath afternoon quiet of that house louder than thunder, louder than laughing even with triumph. Think of the children, Papa said. Think! Ellen said, What else do I do? What else do I lie awake at night and do but think of them? Neither Papa nor Ellen said, Come back home. No, this occurred before it became fashionable to repair your mistakes by turning your back on them and running. It was just the two quiet voices beyond that blank door which might have been discussing something printed in a magazine. And I, a child, standing close beside that door because I was afraid to be there but more afraid to leave it, standing motionless beside that door as though trying to make myself blend with the dark wood and become invisible, like a chameleon, listening to the living spirit, presence of that house, since some of Ellen's life and breath had now gone into it as well as his, breathing away in a long neutral sound of victory and despair, of triumph and terror, too. "'Do you love this?' Papa said. "'Papa,' Ellen said. That was all, but I could see her face then as clearly as Papa could have, with that same expression which it had worn in the carriage on that first Sunday and the others. Then a servant came and said our buggy was ready. Yes, from themselves, not from him, not from anybody, just as nobody could have saved them, even himself, because he now showed us why that triumph had been beneath his notice. He showed Ellen, that is, not I. I was not there. It was six years now during which I had scarcely seen him. Our aunt was gone now, and I was keeping house for Papa. Perhaps once a year Papa and I would go out there and have dinner, and maybe four times a year Ellen and the children would come in and spend the day with us. Not he. That I know of, he never entered this house again after he and Ellen married. I was young then. I was even young enough to believe that this was due to some stubborn coal of conscience, if not remorse, even in him but I know better now. I know now that it was simply because since Papa had given him respectability through a wife, there was nothing else he could want from Papa. And so not even sheer gratitude, let alone appearances, could force him to forego his own pleasure to the extent of taking a family meal with his wife's people. So I saw little of them. I did not have time now to play, even if I had ever had any inclination." I had never learned how, and I saw no reason to try to learn now, even if I had had the time. So it was six years now, though it was actually no secret to Ellen, since it had apparently been going on ever since he drove the last nail in the house, the only difference between now and the time of his bachelorhood being that now they would hitch the teams and saddle horses and mules in the grove beyond the stable, and so come up across the pasture unseen from the house because there were plenty of them still. It was as if God or the devil had taken advantage of his very vices in order to supply witnesses to the discharge of our curse, not only from among gentlefolks, our own kind, 
but from the very scum and riffraff who could not have approached the house itself under any other circumstances, not even from the rear. Yes, Ellen and those two children alone in that house twelve miles from town, and down there in the stable a hollow square of faces in the lantern light, the white faces on three sides, the black ones on the fourth, and in the center two of his wild negroes fighting, naked, fighting not like white men fight with rules and weapons, but like negroes fight to hurt one another quick and bad. Ellen knew that, or thought she did, that was not it. She accepted that, not reconciled, accepted, as though there is a breathing point in outrage where you can accept it almost with gratitude, since you can say to yourself, Thank God this is all, at least I now know all of it. Thinking that, clinging still to that, when she ran into the stable that night while the very men who had stolen into it from the rear fell back away from her with at least some grain of decency, and Ellen seeing not the two black beasts she had expected to see, but instead a white one and a black one, both naked to the waist and gouging at one another's eyes as if their skins should not only have been the same color but should have been covered with fur, too. Yes, it seems that on certain occasions, perhaps at the end of the evening, the spectacle, as a grand finale or perhaps as a matter of sheer deadly forethought toward the retention of supremacy, domination, he would enter the ring with one of the negroes himself. Yes, that is what Ellen saw her husband and the father of her children standing there naked and panting and bloody to the waist, and the negro just fallen evidently, lying at his feet and bloody too, save that on the negro it merely looked like grease or sweat. Ellen running down the hill from the house, bareheaded in time to hear the sound, the screaming, hearing it while she still ran in the darkness and before the spectators knew that she was there, hearing it even before it occurred to one spectator to say, It's a horse, then it's a woman, then, my God, it's a child, ran in, and the spectators fallen back to permit her to see Henry plunge out from among the negroes who had been holding him, screaming and vomiting, not pausing, not even looking at the faces which shrank back away from her as she knelt in the stable filth to raise Henry, and not looking at Henry either but up at him, as he stood there with even his teeth showing beneath his beard now, and another negro wiping the blood from his body with a toe-sack. "'I know you will excuse us, gentlemen,' Ellen said. But they were all ready to parton, nigger and white, slinking out again as they had slunk in, and Ellen not watching them now either, but kneeling in the dirt while Henry clung to her, crying, and he standing there yet while a third nigger prodded his shirt or coat at him as though the coat were a stick and he a caged snake. "'Where is Judith, Thomas?' Ellen said. "'Judith?' he said. "'Oh, he was not lying. His own triumph had outrun him. He had builded even better in evil than even he could have hoped. "'Judith, isn't she in bed?' Don't lie to me, Thomas, Ellen said. I can understand your bringing Henry here to see this, wanting Henry to see this. I will try to understand it. Yes, I will make myself try to understand it. But not Judith, Thomas. Not my baby girl, Thomas. I don't expect you to understand it, he said, because you are a woman. But I didn't bring Judith down here. I would not bring her down here. I don't expect you to believe that, but I swear to it. I wish I could believe you, Ellen said. I want to believe you. Then she began to call. Judith, she called in a voice calm and sweet and filled with despair. Judith, honey, time to come to bed. But I was not there. I was not there to see the two sutpin faces this time, once on Judith and once on the negro girl beside her, looking down through the square entrance to the loft. Chapter 2 It was a summer of wisteria. The twilight was full of it and of the smell of his father's cigar as they sat on the front gallery after supper until it would be time for Quentin to start, while in the deep shaggy lawn below the veranda the fireflies blew and drifted in soft random. The odor, the scent, which five months later Mr. Compson's letter would carry up from Mississippi and over the long iron New England snow and into Quentin's sitting-room at Harvard. It was a day of listening, too, 
The listening, the hearing in 1909, even yet, mostly that which he already knew, since he had been born in, and still breathed, the same air in which the church bells had rung on that Sunday morning in 1833, and on Sundays heard even one of the original three bells in the same steeple where descendants of the same pigeons strutted and crooned or wheeled in short courses resembling soft, fluid paint smears on the soft summer sky. A Sunday morning in June, with the bells ringing peaceful and peremptory and a little cacophonous, the denominations in concord, though not in tune, and the ladies and children, and house negroes to carry the parasols and fly whisks, and even a few men, the ladies moving in hoops among the miniature broadcloth of little boys and the pantalets of little girls, in the skirts of the time when ladies did not walk but floated, when the other men, sitting with their feet on the railing of the Holston House Gallery, looked up, and there the stranger was. He was already halfway across the square when they saw him, on a hard-ridden roan horse, man and beast looking as though they had been created out of thin air and set down in the bright summer Sabbath sunshine in the middle of a tired fox-trot. Face and horse that none of them had ever seen before, name that none of them had ever heard, and origin and purpose which some of them were never to learn. So that in the next four weeks, Jefferson was a village then, the Holston House, the courthouse, six stores, a blacksmith and livery stable, a saloon frequented by drovers and peddlers, three churches and perhaps thirty residences. The stranger's name went back and forth among the places of business and of idleness, and among the residences, in steady strophe and antistrophe. Sutpen, 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 Sutpen. That was all that the town was to know about him for almost a month. He had apparently come into town from the south, a man of about twenty-five, as the town learned later, because at the time his age could not have been guessed, because at that time he looked like a man who had been sick, not like a man who had been peacefully ill in bed, and had recovered to move with a sort of diffident and tentative amazement in a world which he had believed himself on the point of surrendering, but like a man who had been through some solitary furnace experience which was more than just fever, like an explorer, say, who not only had to face the normal hardship of the pursuit which he chose, but was overtaken by the added and unforeseen handicap of the fever also, and fought through it at enormous cost, not so much physical as mental, alone and unaided, and not through blind instinctive will to endure and survive, but to gain and keep to enjoy it the material prize for which he accepted the original gambit. A man with a big frame, but gaunt now almost to emaciation, with a short reddish beard which resembled a disguise, and above which his pale eyes had a quality at once visionary and alert, ruthless and reposed, in a face whose flesh had the appearance of pottery, of having been colored by that oven's fever either of soul or environment, deeper than sun alone beneath a dead impervious surface as of glazed clay. That was what they saw, though it was years before the town learned that that was all which he possessed at the time the strong spent horse and the clothes on his back, and a small saddle-bag scarcely large enough to contain the spare linen and the razors, and the two pistols of which Miss Coldfield told Quentin, with the butts worn smooth as pick-handles, and which he used with the precision of knitting-needles. Later Quentin's grandfather saw him ride at a canter around a sapling at twenty feet, and put both bullets into a playing card fastened to the tree. He had a room in the Holston house, but he carried the key with him, and each morning he fed and saddled the horse and rode away before daylight, where, too, the town likewise failed to learn, probably due to the fact that he gave the pistol demonstration on the third day after his arrival. So they had to depend on inquiry to find out what they could about him, which would of necessity be at night at the supper table in the Holston house dining room, or in the lounge which he would have to cross to gain his room and lock the door again which he would do as soon as he finished eating. The bar opened into the lounge, too, and that would or should have been the place to accost him and even inquire, except for the fact that he did not use the bar. He did not drink at all, he told them. He did not say that he used to drink and had quit, nor that he had never used alcohol. He just said that he would not care for a drink. It was years later before even Quentin's grandfather, he was a young man, too, then, it would be years yet before he would become General Compson, learned that the reason Sutpen did not drink was that he did not have the money with which to pay his share or return the courtesy. 
It was General Compson who first realized that at this time Sutman lacked not only the money to spend for drink and conviviality, but the time and inclination as well. That he was at this time completely the slave of his secret and furious impatience, his conviction gained from whatever that recent experience had been, that fever, mental or physical, of a need for haste, of time fleeing beneath him, which was to drive him for the next five years, as General Compson computed it, roughly until about nine months before his son was born. So they would catch him, run him to earth in the lounge between the supper table and his locked door to give him the opportunity to tell them who he was and where he came from and what he was up to, whereupon he would move gradually and steadily until his back came in contact with something, a post or a wall, and then stand there and tell them nothing whatever as pleasantly and courteously as a hotel clerk. It was the Chickasaw Indian agent with or through whom he dealt, and so it was not until he waked the county recorder that Saturday night with the deed, patent to the land, and the gold Spanish coin, that the town learned that he now owned a hundred square miles of some of the best virgin bottom land in the country, though even that knowledge came too late, because Sutpen himself was gone, where to again they did not know. But he owned land among them now, and some of them began to suspect what General Compson apparently knew, that the Spanish coin with which he had paid to have his patent recorded was the last one of any kind which he possessed. So they were certain now that he had departed to get more. There were several who even anticipated in believing, and even in saying aloud now that he was not present, what Sutpen's future and then unborn sister-in-law was to tell Quentin almost eighty years later that he had found some unique and practical way of hiding loot, and that he had returned to the cache to replenish his pockets, even if he had not actually ridden with the two pistols back to the river and the steamboats full of gamblers and cotton and slave dealers to replenish the cache. At least some of them were telling one another that when two months later he returned, again without warning and accompanied this time by the covered wagon with a negro driving it, and on the seat with the negro a small, alertly resigned man with a grim, harried Latin face, in a frock coat and a flowered waistcoat and a hat which would have created no furor on a Paris boulevard, all of which he was to wear constantly for the next two years, the somberly theatric clothing and the expression of fatalistic and amazed determination, while his white client and the negro crew which he was to advise, though not direct, went stark naked save for a coating of dried mud. This was the French architect. Years later the town learned that he had come all the way from Martinique on Sutpen's bare promise, and lived for two years on venison cooked over a campfire, in an unfloored tent made of the wagon hood, before he so much as saw any color or shape of pay. And until he passed through town on his way back to New Orleans two years later, he was not even to see Jefferson again. He would not come, or Sutpen would not bring him to town, even on the few occasions when Sutpen would be seen there and he did not have much chance to look at Jefferson on that first day because the wagon did not stop. Apparently it was only by sheer geographical hap that Sutpen passed through town at all, pausing only long enough for someone, not General Compson, to look beneath the wagon hood and into a black tunnel filled with still eyeballs and smelling like a wolf den. But the legend of Sutpen's wild negroes was not to begin at once, because the wagon went on as though even the wood and iron which composed it, as well as the mules which drew it, had become imbued by sheer association with him with that quality of gaunt and tireless driving, that conviction for haste and of fleeing time. Later Sutpen told Quentin's grandfather that on that afternoon when the wagon passed through Jefferson, they had been without food since the previous night, and that he was trying to reach Sutpen's hundred and the river bottom to try to kill a deer before dark. So he and the architect and the negroes would not have to spend another night without food. So the legend of the wild men came gradually back to town, brought by the men who would ride out to watch what was going on, who began to tell how Sutpen would take stand beside a game trail with the pistols, and send the negroes in to drive the swamp like a pack of hounds. It was they who told how during that first summer and fall the negroes did not even have, or did not use, blankets to sleep in, even before the coon hunter Acres claimed to have walked one of them out of the absolute mud like a sleeping alligator and screamed just in time. The negroes could speak no English yet, and doubtless there were more than Acres who did not know that the language in which they and Sutpen communicated was a sort of French, and not some dark and fatal tongue of their own. 
There were many more than Acres, though the others were responsible citizens and landowners and so did not have to look about the camp at night. In fact, as Miss Coldfield told Quentin, they would make up parties to meet at the Holston house and go out horseback, often carrying lunch. Sutphin had built a brick kiln, and he had set up the saw and planer which he had brought in the wagon, a capstan with a long sapling walking beam, with the wagon team and the negroes in shifts, and himself too when necessary, when the machinery slowed, hitched to it. As if the negroes actually were wild men, as General Compson told his son, Quentin's father, while the negroes were working, Sutphin never raised his voice at them, that instead he led them, caught them at the psychological instant by example, by some ascendancy of forbearance rather than by brute fear. Without dismounting, usually Sutphin did not even greet them with as much as a nod, apparently as unaware of their presence as if they had been idle shades. They would sit in a curious quiet clump as though for mutual protection, and watch his mansion rise, carried plank by plank and brick by brick out of the swamp where the clay and timber waited. The bearded white man and the twenty black ones and all stark naked beneath the crouching and pervading mud. Being men, these spectators did not realize that the garments which Sutton had worn when he first rode into Jefferson were the only ones in which they had ever seen him, and few of the women in the county had seen him at all yet. Otherwise, some of them would have anticipated Miss Coldfield in this too. In divining that he was saving his clothes, since decorum, even if not elegance of appearance, would be the only weapon, or rather ladder, with which he could conduct the last assault upon what Miss Coldfield and perhaps others believed to be respectability. That respectability which, according to General Compson, consisted in Sutton's secret mind of a great deal more than the mere acquisition of a chatelaine for his house. So he and the twenty negroes worked together, plastered over with mud against the mosquitoes, and, as Miss Coldfield told Quentin, distinguishable one from another by his beard and eyes alone, and only the architect resembling a human creature because of the French clothes which he wore constantly with a sort of invincible fatality, until the day after the house was completed, save for the window glass and the ironware which they could not make by hand, and the architect departed working in the sun and heat of summer and the mud and ice of winter, with quiet and unflagging fury. It took him two years, he and his crew of imported slaves, which his adopted fellow citizens still looked on as being a good deal more deadly than any beast he could have started and slain in that country. They worked from sunup to sundown, while parties of horsemen rode up and sat their horses quietly and watched, and the architect in his formal coat and his Paris hat and his expression of grim and embittered amazement lurked about the environs of the scene, with his air something between a casual and bitterly disinterested spectator and a condemned and conscientious ghost. Amazement, General Compson said, not at the others and what they were doing so much as at himself, at the inexplicable and incredible fact of his own presence. But he was a good architect. Quentin knew the house twelve miles from Jefferson in its grove of cedar and oak, seventy-five years after it was finished. And not only an architect, as General Compson said, but an artist, since only an artist could have borne those two years in order to build a house which he doubtless not only expected, but firmly intended never to see again. Not, General Compson said, the hardship to sense and the outrage to sensibility of the two years' sojourn, but Sutpen, that only an artist could have borne Sutpen's ruthlessness and hurry, and still managed to curb the dream of grim and castle-like magnificence at which Sutpen obviously aimed. Since the place, as Sutpen planned it, would have been almost as large as Jefferson itself at the time, that the little grim-harried foreigner had single-handed given battle to and vanquished Sutpen's fierce and overweening vanity, or desire for magnificence, or for vindication, or whatever it was, even General Compson did not know yet, and so created of Sutpen's very defeat the victory which, in conquering, Sutpen himself would have failed to gain. So it was finished then, down to the last plank and brick and wooden pin which they could make themselves. Unpainted and unfurnished, without a pane of glass or a doorknob or hinge in it, twelve miles from town and almost that far from any neighbor, it stood for three years more, surrounded by its formal gardens and promenades, its slave quarters and stables and smokehouses. 
Wild turkey ranged within a mile of the house, and deer came light and colored like smoke and left delicate prints in the formal beds where there would be no flowers for four years yet. Now there began a period, a phase, during which the town and the county watched him with more puzzlement yet. Perhaps it was because the next step toward that secret end which General Compson claimed to have known, but which the town and the country comprehended but dimly or not at all, now required patience or passive time instead of that driving fury to which he had accustomed them. Now it was the women who first suspected what he wanted, what the next step would be. None of the men, certainly not those who knew him well enough to call him by name, suspected that he wanted a wife. Doubtless there were some of them, husbands and bachelors both, who not only would have refused to entertain the idea, but would even have protested against it, because for the next three years he led what must have been to them a perfect existence. He lived out there, eight miles from any neighbor, in masculine solitude in what might be called the half-acre gun-room of a baronial splendor. He lived in the Spartan shell of the largest edifice in the county, not excepting the courthouse itself, whose threshold no woman had so much as seen, without any feminized softness of window-pane or door or mattress, where there was not only no woman to object if he should elect to have his dogs in to sleep on the pallet-bed with him, he did not even need dogs to kill the game which left footprints within sight of the kitchen door, but hunted it instead with human beings who belonged to him body and soul, and of whom it was believed or said that they could creep up to a bedded buck and cut its throat before it could move. It was at this time that he began to invite the parties of men of which Miss Coldfield told Quentin, out to Sutpen's Hundred to camp in blankets in the naked rooms of his embryonic formal opulence. They hunted, and at night played cards and drank, and on occasion he doubtless pitted his negroes against one another, and perhaps even at this time participated now and then himself. That spectacle which, according to Miss Coldfield, his son was unable to bear the sight of while his daughter looked on unmoved. Sutpen drank himself now, though there were probably others beside Quentin's grandfather who remarked that he drank very sparingly, save when he himself had managed to supply some of the liquor. His guests would bring whiskey out with them, but he drank of this with a sort of sparing calculation, as though keeping mentally, General Compson said, a sort of balance of spiritual solvency between the amount of whiskey he accepted and the amount of running meat which he supplied to the guns. He lived like that for three years. He now had a plantation. Inside of two years he had dragged house and gardens out of virgin swamp, and plowed and planted his land with seed cotton which General Compson loaned him. Then he seemed to quit. He seemed to just sit down in the middle of what he had almost finished, and to remain so for three years during which he did not even appear to intend or want anything more. Perhaps it is not to be wondered at that the men in the county came to believe that the life he now led had been his aim all the time. It was General Compson, who seemed to have known him well enough to offer to lend him seed cotton for his start, who knew any better, to whom Sutpen never told anything about his past. It was General Compson who knew first about the Spanish coin being his last one. As it was Compson, so the town learned later, who offered to lend Sutpen the money to finish and furnish his house, and was refused. So doubtless General Compson was the first man in the county to tell himself that Sutpen did not need to borrow money with which to complete the house, supply what it yet lacked, because he intended to marry it. Not the first person, the first man, since, according to what Miss Coldfield told Quentin seventy-five years later, the women in the county had been telling one another and their husbands as well that Sutpen did not intend to quit there, that he had already gone to too much trouble, gone through too much privation and hardship, to settle down and live exactly as he had lived while the house was being built, save that now he had a roof to sleep under in place of an unfloored wagon hood. Probably the women had already cast about among the families of the men who might now be called his friends, for that prospective bride whose dowry might complete the shape and substance of that respectability Miss Coldfield, anyway, believed to be his aim. So when, at the expiration of this second phase, three years after the house was finished and the architect departed, and again on Sunday morning and again without warning, the town saw him cross the square, on foot now but in the same garments in which he had ridden into town five years ago, and which no one had seen since. He or one of the negroes had ironed the coat with heated bricks, General Compson told Quentin's father, and entered the Methodist church. Only some of the men were surprised. 
The women merely said that he had exhausted the possibilities of the families of the men with whom he had hunted and gambled, and that he had now come to town to find a wife exactly as he would have gone to the Memphis market to buy livestock or slaves. But when they comprehended whom it was that he had apparently come to town and into church to invest with his choice, the assurance of the women became one with the men's surprise, and then even more than that, amazement. Because the town now believed that it knew him. For two years it had watched him, as with that grim and unflagging fury he had erected that shell of a house and laid out his fields, then for three years he had remained completely static, as if he were run by electricity and someone had come along and removed, dismantled, the wiring or the dynamo, while the women of the county gradually convinced it that he was merely waiting to find a wife with a dowry to finish it with, so that when he entered the Methodist church that Sunday morning in his ironed coat, there were men as well as women who believed that they had only to look around the congregation in order to anticipate the direction his feet would take him until they became aware that he had apparently marked down Miss Coldfield's father with the same cold and ruthless deliberation with which he had probably marked down the French architect. They watched in shocked amazement while he laid deliberate siege to the one man in the town with whom he could have had nothing in common, least of all money, a man who obviously could do nothing under the sun for him save give him credit at a little crossroads store or cast a vote in his favor if he should ever seek ordination as a Methodist minister a Methodist steward, a merchant, not only of modest position and circumstances, but who already had a wife and family of his own, let alone a dependent mother and sister, to support out of the proceeds of a business which he had brought to Jefferson ten years ago in a single wagon, a man with a name for absolute and undeviating and even Puritan uprightness in a country and time of lawless opportunity, who neither drank nor gambled nor even hunted. In their surprise, they forgot that Mr. Coldfield had a marriageable daughter. They did not consider the daughter at all. They did not think of love in connection with Sutpen. They thought of ruthlessness rather than justice, and of fear rather than respect, but not of pity or love. Besides being too lost in amazed speculation as to just how Sutpen intended or could contrive to use Mr. Coldfield to further whatever secret ends he still had, they were never to know. Even Miss Rosa Coldfield did not, because from that day there were no more hunting parties out at Sutton's Hundred, and when they saw him now it would be in town, but not loafing, idling. The men who had slept and matched glasses with him under his roof, some of them had even come to call him Sutton without the formal mister, watched him pass along the street before the Holston house with a single formal gesture to his hat and go on and enter Mr. Coldfield's store, and that was all. Then one day he quitted Jefferson for the second time, Mr. Compson told Quentin. The town should have been accustomed to that by now. Nevertheless, his position had subtly changed, as you will see by the town's reaction to this second return. Because when he came back this time, he was in a sense a public enemy. Perhaps this was because of what he brought back with him this time, the material he brought back this time, as compared to the simple wagon load of wild niggers which he had brought back before but I don't think so. That is, I think it was a little more involved than the sheer value of his chandeliers and mahogany and rugs. I think that the affront was born of the town's realization that he was getting it involved with himself, that whatever the felony which produced the mahogany and crystal, he was forcing the town to compound it. Heretofore, until that Sunday when he came to church, if he had misused or injured anybody, it was only old Ikamotubi from whom he got his land, a matter between his conscience and Uncle Sam and God. But now his position had changed, because when, about three months after he departed, four wagons left Jefferson to go to the river and meet him, it was known that Mr. Coldfield was the man who hired and dispatched them. They were big wagons, drawn by oxen, and when they returned, the town looked at them and knew, no matter what they might have contained, that Mr. Coldfield could not have mortgaged everything that he owned for enough to fill them. Doubtless this time there were more men than women even who pictured him during this absence with a handkerchief over his face and the two pistol barrels glinting beneath the candelabra of a steamboat saloon, even if no worse if not something performed in the lurking dark of a muddy landing and with a knife from behind. 
They saw him pass on the roan horse beside his four wagons. It seems that even the ones who had eaten his food and shot his game and even called him Sutpen without the mister didn't accost him now. They just waited while reports and rumors came back to town of how he and his now somewhat tamed negroes had installed the windows and doors and the spits and pots in the kitchen and the crystal chandeliers in the parlors and the furniture and the curtains and the rugs. It was that same Acres who had blundered onto the mud-couched negro five years ago, who came, a little wild-eyed and considerably slack-mouthed, into the Holston House bar one evening, and said, "'Boys, this time he stole the whole darn steamboat.' So at last civic virtue came to a boil. This book is continued on Disc 2. Disc 2 So at last civic virtue came to a boil. One day, and with the sheriff of the county among them, a party of eight or ten took the road out to Sutpen's Hundred. They did not go all the way, because about six miles from town they met Sutpen himself. He was riding the roan horse, in the frock coat and the beaver hat which they knew, and with his legs wrapped in a piece of tarpaulin. He had a portmanteau on his pummel, and he was carrying a small woven basket on his arm. He stopped the roan, it was April then, and the road was still a quagmire, and sat there in his splashed tarpaulin and looked from one face to the next. Your grandfather said that his eyes looked like pieces of a broken plate, and that his beard was strong as a currycomb. That was how he put it, strong as a currycomb. "'Good morning, gentlemen,' he said. "'Were you looking for me?' Doubtless something more than this transpired at the time, though none of the Vigilance Committee ever told it that I know of. All I ever heard is how the town, the men on the gallery of the Holston House, saw Sutpen and the committee ride onto the square together, Sutpen a little in front and the others bunched behind him, Sutpen with his legs and feet wrapped neatly in his tarpaulin, and his shoulders squared inside the worn broadcloth coat, and that worn, brushed beaver cocked a little, talking to them over his shoulder, and those eyes hard and pale and reckless, and probably quizzical and maybe contemptuous even then. He pulled up at the door, and the negro hostler ducked out and took the roan's head, and Sutpen got down with his portmanteau and the basket, and mounted the steps, and I heard how he turned there and looked at them again where they huddled on their horses, not knowing what to do exactly and it might have been a good thing that he had that beard and they could not see his mouth. Then he turned, and he looked at the other men sitting with their feet on the railing and watching him too, men who used to come out to his place and sleep on the floor and hunt with him, and he saluted them with that florid swagger and gesture to the hat. Yes, he was underbred. It showed like this always, your grandfather said, in all his formal contacts with people. He was like John L. Sullivan, having taught himself painfully and tediously to do the shottish, having drilled himself and drilled himself in secret until he now believed it no longer necessary to count the music's beat, say. He may have believed that your grandfather or Judge Benbow might have done it a little more effortlessly than he, but he would not have believed that anyone could have beat him in knowing when to do it and how. And besides, it was in his face. That was where his power lay, your grandfather said that anyone could look at him and say, Given the occasion and the need, this man can and will do anything. And went on into the house and commanded a chamber. So they sat on their horses and waited for him. I suppose they knew that he would have to come out sometime. I suppose they sat there and thought about those two pistols. Because there was still no warrant for him, you see. It was just public opinion in an acute state of indigestion. And now other horsemen rode into the square and became aware of the situation, so that there was quite a posse waiting when he walked out onto the gallery. He wore a new hat now and a new broadcloth coat, so they knew what the portmanteau had contained. They even knew now what the basket had contained, because he did not have that with him now either, though doubtless at the time it merely puzzled them more than ever. Because, you see, 
They had been too busy speculating on just how he was planning to use Mr. Coldfield, and since his return, too completely outraged by the belief that they now saw the results, even if the means were still an enigma, to remember about Miss Ellen at all. So he stopped again, doubtless, and looked from face to face again, doubtless memorizing the new faces, without any haste, with still the beard to hide whatever his mouth might have shown. But he seems to have said nothing at all this time. He just ascended the steps and walked on across the square. The committee, your grandfather said it had grown to almost fifty by now, moving to, following him across the square. They say he did not even look back. He just walked on, erect, with the new hat cocked and carrying in his hand now that which must have seemed to them the final gratuitous bafflement and even insult, with the committee riding along in the street beside him and not quite parallel, and others who did not happen to have horses at the moment joining in and following the committee in the road, and ladies and children and women slaves coming to the doors and windows of the homes as they passed, to watch as they went on in grim tableau, and Sutpen, still without once looking back, entered Mr. Coldfield's gate and strode on up the brick walk to the door, carrying his newspaper cornucopia of flowers. They waited for him again. The crowd was growing fast now. Other men and a few boys and even some negroes from the adjacent houses— Plotting behind the eight original members of the committee, who sat watching Mr. Coldfield's door, until he emerged. It was a good while, and he no longer carried the flowers, and when he returned to the gate, he was engaged to be married. But they did not know this, because as soon as he reached the gate, they arrested him. They took him back to town, with the ladies and children and house niggers watching from behind curtains and behind the shrubbery in the yards and the corners of the houses the kitchens where doubtless food was already beginning to scorch, and so back to the square where the rest of the able-bodied men left their offices and stores to follow, so that when he reached the courthouse, Sutpen had a larger following than if he actually had been the runaway slave. They arraigned him before a justice, but by that time your grandfather and Mr. Coldfield had got there. They signed his bond, and late that afternoon he returned home with Mr. Coldfield, walking along the same street as of the forenoon, with doubtless the same faces watching him from behind the window curtains, to the betrothal supper, with no wine at table and no whiskey before or after. I have heard how during none of his three passages that day through that street did his barren altar. The same unhurried stride to which that new frock coat swung, the same angle to the new hat above the eyes and the beard. Your grandfather said that some of the faience appearance, which the flesh of his face had had when he came to town five years ago, was gone now, and that his face had an honest sunburn. And he was not fleshier, either. Your grandfather said that was not it. It was just that the flesh on his bones had become quieter, as though passive after some actual breasting of atmosphere, like in running, so that he actually filled his clothes now with that quality still swaggering but without braggadocio or belligerence, though according to your grandfather the quality had never been belligerence, only watchfulness. And now that was gone, as though after the three years he could trust his eyes alone to do the watching, without the flesh on his bones standing sentry also. Two months later he and Miss Ellen were married. It was in June of 1838, almost five years to the day from that Sunday morning when he rode into town on the roan horse. It, the wedding, was in the same Methodist church where he saw Ellen for the first time, according to Miss Rosa. The aunt had even forced or nagged, not cajoled, that would not have done it, Mr. Coldfield into allowing Ellen to wear powder on her face for the occasion. The powder was to hide the marks of tears. But before the wedding was over, the powder was streaked again, caked and channeled. Ellen seems to have entered the church that night out of weeping as though out of rain, gone through the ceremony and then walked back out of the church and into the weeping again, the tears again, the same tears even, the same rain. She got into the carriage and departed in it, the rain, for Sutpen's hundred. It was the wedding which caused the tears not Mary and Sutphin. 
Whatever tears there were for that, granted there were tears, came later. It was not intended to be a big wedding. That is, Mr. Coldfield seems not to have intended it to be. Of the two men, I don't speak of Ellen, of course. In fact, you will notice that most divorces occur with women who were married by tobacco-chewing J.P.s in country courthouses, or by ministers waked after midnight, with their suspenders showing beneath their coattails and no collar on, and a wife or spinster sister in curl papers for witness. So is it too much to believe that these women come to long for divorce from a sense not of incompleteness, but of actual frustration and betrayal? that regardless of the breathing evidence of children and all else, they still have in their minds even yet the image of themselves walking to music and turning heads, in all the symbolical trappings and circumstances of ceremonial surrender of that which they no longer possess? And why not, since to them the actual and authentic surrender can only be, and have been, a ceremony like the breaking of a banknote to buy a ticket for the train? Of the two men it was Sutton who desired, or hoped, I have this from something your grandfather let drop one day, and which he doubtless had from Sutton himself in the same accidental fashion, since Sutton never even told Ellen that he wanted it, which, the fact that at the last minute he refused to support her and her desire and insistence upon it, accounts partly for the tears. The big wedding, the full church, and all the ritual— Mr. Coldfield apparently intended merely to employ, use, the church, apart from its spiritual significance, exactly as he might or would have used any other object, concrete or abstract, to which he had given a certain amount of his time. He seems to have intended to use the church into which he had invested a certain amount of sacrifice and doubtless self-denial, and certainly actual labor and money, for the sake of what might be called a demand balance of spiritual solvency exactly as he would have used a cotton gin in which he considered himself to have incurred either interest or responsibility for the ginning of any cotton which he or any member of his family, by blood or by marriage, had raised. That, and no more. Perhaps this was due to the same tedious and unremittent husbandry which had enabled him to support mother and sister and marry and raise a family on the proceeds of that store, which ten years ago had fitted into a single wagon. Or perhaps it was some innate sense of delicacy and fitness, which his sister and daughter did not seem to possess, by the way, regarding the prospective son-in-law whom just two months ago he had been instrumental in getting out of jail. But not from any lack of courage regarding the son-in-law's still anomalous position in the town. Regardless of what their relations before that had been and of what their future relations might be, if Mr. Coldfield had believed Sutphin guilty at the time of any crime, he would not have raised a finger to take Sutphin out. He might not have gone out of his way to keep Sutphin in jail, but doubtless the best possible moral fumigation which Sutphin could have received at the time in the eyes of his fellow citizens was the fact that Mr. Coldfield signed his bond, something he would not have done to save his own good name, even though the arrest had been a direct result of the business between himself and Sutphin. That affair which, when it reached a point where his conscience refused to sanction it, he had withdrawn from and let Sutphin take all the profit, refusing even to allow Sutphin to reimburse him for the loss, which, in withdrawn, he had suffered, though he did permit his daughter to marry this man of whose actions his conscience did not approve. This was the second time he did something like that. When they were married, there were just ten people in the church, including the wedding party, of the hundred who had been invited. Though when they emerged from the church, it was at night, Sutphin had brought in a half-dozen of his wild negroes to wait at the door with burning pine knots. The rest of the hundred were there in the persons of boys and youths and men from the drover's tavern on the edge of town, stock traders and hostlers and such who had not been invited. That was the other half of the reason for Ellen's tears. It was the aunt who persuaded or cajoled Mr. Coldfield into the big wedding. Sutphin had not expressed himself, but he wanted it. In fact, Miss Rosa was righter than she knew. He did want, not the anonymous wife and the anonymous children, but the two names, the stainless wife and the unimpeachable father-in-law, on the license, the patent. Yes, patent— with a gold seal and red ribbons, too, if that had been practicable, but not for himself. 
She, Miss Rosa, would have called the gold seal and the ribbons vanity. But then, so had vanity conceived that house, and, in a strange place and with little else but his bare hands and further handicapped by the chance and probability of meddling interference arising out of the disapprobation of all communities of men toward any situation which they do not understand, built it. And pride. She admitted to you that he was brave. Perhaps she will even allow him pride, the same pride which wanted such a house, which would accept nothing less, and drove through to get it at whatever cost, and then lived in it, alone, on a pallet on the floor for three years until he could furnish it as it should be furnished. Not the least of which furniture was that wedding license. She was quite right. It was not just shelter, not just anonymous wife and children that he wanted, just as he did not want just wedding but he never told Ellen nor anyone. In fact, when the female crisis came, when Ellen and the aunt tried to enlist him on their side to persuade Mr. Coldfield to the big wedding, he refused to support them. He doubtless remembered even better than Mr. Coldfield that two months ago he had been in jail. That public opinion, which at some moment during the five preceding years had swallowed him, even though he never had quite ever lain quiet on its stomach, had performed one of mankind's natural and violent and inexplicable volt faces and regurgitated him. And it did not help him any that at least two of the citizens who should have made two of the teeth in the outraged jaw served instead as props to hold the jaw open and impotent while he walked out of it unharmed. Ellen and the aunt remember this, too. The aunt did. Being a woman, she was doubtless one of that league of Jefferson women who, on the second day after the town saw him five years ago, had agreed never to forgive him for not having any past, and who had remained consistent. Since the marriage was now a closed incident, she probably looked upon it as the one chance to thrust him back into the gullet of public opinion which had tried at last to refuse him, not only to secure her niece's future as his wife, but to justify the action of her brother in getting him out of jail, and her own position as having apparently sanctioned and permitted the wedding which in reality she could not have prevented. This, as Miss Rosa told you, for the sake of that big house and the position and state which the women realized long before the men did, that he not only aimed at but was going to attain. Or maybe women are even less complex than that, and to them any wedding is better than no wedding, and a big wedding with a villain preferable to a small one with a saint. So the aunt even used Ellen's tears, and Suckman, who probably knew about what was going to happen, becoming as the time drew near graver and graver, not concerned, just watchful, like he must have been from the day when he turned his back upon all that he knew, the faces and the customs, and— he was just fourteen then, he told your grandfather, just the same age that Henry was that night in the stable which Miss Rosa told you about, which Henry could not quite stand up to, set out into a world which, even in theory, the average geographical schooling of the normal boy of fourteen, he knew nothing about, and with a fixed goal in his mind, which most men do not set up until the blood begins to slow at thirty or more, and then only because the image represents peace and indolence, or at least a crowning of vanity, not the vindication of a past affront in the person of a son whose seed is not yet, and would not be for years yet, planted. That same alertness which he had to wear day and night without changing or laying aside, like the clothing which, without doubt and for a time at least, he had to sleep in as well as live in, and in a country and among a people whose very language he had to learn— and where because of this he was able to make that mistake which, if he had acquiesced to it, would not even have been an error, and which, since he refused to accept it or be stopped by it, became his doom. That unsleeping care which must have known that it could permit itself but one mistake. That alertness for measuring and weighing event against eventuality, circumstance against human nature, his own fallible judgment and mortal clay, against not only human but natural forces, choosing and discarding, compromising with his dream and his ambition, like you must with the horse which you take across country over timber, which you control only through your ability to keep the animal from realizing that actually you cannot, that actually it is the stronger. 
His was the curious position now. His was the solitary one, not Ellen. She not only had the aunt to support her, but the fact that women never plead nor claim loneliness until impenetrable and insurmountable circumstances forces them to give up all hope of attaining the particular bauble which at the moment they happen to want. And not Mr. Coldfield. He had not only public opinion, but his own disinclination for the big wedding to support it without incongruity or paradox. As Ellen had her aunt as well as her own desire for the big wedding to support it without incongruity or paradox. While Sutphin wanted the big wedding more than Ellen did, or for a deeper reason than she did, yet his judgment forewarned him how the town would take it even more than Mr. Coldfield's did. So while Ellen was using her tears not only to coerce her father, but to persuade Sutphin to put his weight into the balance on her side, he had but one enemy, Mr. Coldfield. But when he refused her, when he remained neutral, he had three, counting the aunt. Then, the tears won, Ellen and the aunt wrote out a hundred invitations, Sutphin brought in one of the wild negroes who carried them from door to door by hand, and even sent out a dozen more personal ones for the dress rehearsal. When they reached the church for the rehearsal on the night before the wedding, and found the church itself empty, and a handful of men from the town's purlieus, including two of old Dick and Matubi's Chickasaws, standing in the shadows outside the door, the tears came down again. Ellen went through the rehearsal, but afterward the aunt took her home in a state very near hysteria, though by the next day it had become just quiet, intermittent weeping again. There was some talk even of putting the wedding off. I don't know who it came from, perhaps from Sutpen, but I know who vetoed it. It was as though the aunt were now bent, no longer on merely thrusting Sutpen down the town's throat, but thrusting the wedding itself. She spent all the next day going from house to house, the invitation list in her hand, in a house dress and a shawl and one of the Coldfield Negroes, they were both women, following her, perhaps for protection, perhaps just sucked along like a leaf in the wake of that grim virago fury of female affront. Yes, she came to our house, though your grandfather had never intended anything else but to attend the wedding. The aunt must have had no doubts about father, since father had helped take Sutpen out of jail, though she was probably past all ratiocination by then. She came to our house, too. Father and your grandmother were just married then, and mother was a stranger in Jefferson, and I don't know what she thought except that she would never talk about what happened about the mad woman whom she had never seen before, who came bursting into the house, not to invite her to a wedding, but to dare her not to come, and then rushed out again. Mother could not even tell what wedding she meant at first, and when father came home he found mother in hysterics too, and even twenty years later mother could not tell what actually happened. There was nothing comic in it to her. Father used to tease her about it, but even twenty years after that day, when he would tease her, I have seen her begin to raise her hand, perhaps with the thimble on one finger, as though to protect herself, and the same look come into her face that must have been there when Ellen's aunt departed. She covered the town that morning. It did not take her long, and it was complete. By nightfall the circumstances of the situation had spread not only beyond the town, but beneath it penetrating the livery stable and the drover's tavern which was to supply the guests who did attend it, not only as notice, but as a blanket threat and dare. Ellen, of course, was not aware of this any more than the aunt herself was, or would have believed what was going to happen even if she had been clairvoyant, could actually have seen the rehearsal of events before time produced them. Not that the aunt would have considered herself insulated against being thus affronted, she simply could not have believed that her intentions and actions of the day could have any result other than the one for which she had surrendered for the time, not only all cold-field dignity, but all female modesty as well. Sutphin, I suppose, could have told her, but doubtless he knew that the aunt would not have believed him. Probably he did not even try. He just did the only thing he could do, which was to send out to Sutphin's hundred, and bring in six or seven more of his negroes, men on whom he could depend the only men on whom he could depend, and arm them with the lighted pine knots which they were holding at the door when the carriage came up and the wedding party got out. And this is where the tears stopped, because now the street before the church was lined with carriages and buggies. 
though only Sutpen and possibly Mr. Coldfield remarked that instead of being drawn up before the door and empty, they were halted across the street and still occupied, and that now the banquet before the church door was a sort of arena lighted by the smoke and torches which the negroes held above their heads, the light of which wavered and gleamed upon the two lines of faces between which the party would have to pass to enter the church. There were no catcalls yet, no jeering. Evidently neither Ellen nor the aunt suspected that anything was wrong. Because for the time Ellen even walked out of the weeping, the tears, and so into the church. It was empty yet save for your grandfather and grandmother, and perhaps a half-dozen more who might have come out of loyalty to the cold fields, or perhaps to be close and so miss nothing of that which the town, as represented by the waiting carriages, seemed to have anticipated as well as Sutpen did. It was still empty even after the ceremony started and concluded. Because Ellen had something of pride, too, or at least that vanity which at times can assume the office of pride and fortitude. Besides, nothing had happened yet. The crowd outside was quiet yet, perhaps out of respect for the church, out of that aptitude and eagerness of the Anglo-Saxon for complete mystical acceptance of immolated sticks and stones. She seems to have walked out of the church and so into it without any warning whatever. Perhaps she was still moving beneath that pride which would not allow the people inside the church to see her weep. She just walked into it, probably hurrying toward the seclusion of the carriage where she could weep. Perhaps her first intimation was the voice shouting, Look out! Don't hit her now! And then the object, dirt, filth, whatever it was, passing her, or perhaps the change in light itself as she turned and saw one of the negroes, his torch raised and in the act of springing toward the crowd, the faces, when Sutpen spoke to him in that tongue which even now a good part of the county did not know was a civilized language. That was what she saw, what the others saw from the halted carriages across the street, the bride shrinking into the shelter of his arm as he drew her behind him, and he standing there, not moving even after another object, they threw nothing which could actually injure, it was only clods of dirt and vegetable refuse, struck the hat from his head, and a third struck him full in the chest, standing there motionless with an expression almost of smiling where his teeth showed through the beard, holding his wild negroes with that one word. There were doubtless pistols in the crowd, certainly knives. The negro would not have lived ten seconds if he had sprung. While about the wedding party the circle of faces with open mouths and torch-reflecting eyes seemed to advance and waver and shift and vanish in the smoky glare of the burning pine. He retreated to the carriage, shielding the two women with his body, ordering the negroes to follow with another word. But they threw nothing else. Apparently it was that first spontaneous outburst, though they had come armed and prepared with the ones they did throw. In fact, that seemed to have been the entire business which had come to a head when the Vigilance Committee followed him to Mr. Coldfield's gate that day two months before. Because the men who had composed the mob, the traders and drovers and teamsters, returned, vanished back into the region from which they had emerged for this one occasion like rats, scattered, departed about the country, faces which even Ellen was not to remember, seen for the night or the meal or just the drink at other taverns, twenty and fifty and a hundred miles further on along nameless roads, and then gone from there too. And those who had come in the carriages and buggies to see a Roman holiday, driving out to Sutpen's hundred to call, and the men to hunt his game and eat his food again, and on occasion gathering at night in his stable, while he matched two of his wild negroes against one another as men match gamecocks, or perhaps even entered the ring himself. It blew away, though not out of memory. He did not forget that night, even though Ellen, I think, did, since she washed it out of her remembering with tears. Yes, she was weeping again now. It did indeed rain on that marriage. Chapter 3 If he threw her over, I wouldn't think she would want to tell anybody about it, Quentin said. Ah, Mr. Compson said again. After Mr. Coldfield died in sixty-four, Miss Rosa moved out to Sutpen's Hundred to live with Judith. She was twenty then, four years younger than the niece whom, in obedience to her sister's dying request, 
she set out to save from the family's doom, which Sufpin seemed bent on accomplishing, apparently by the process of marrying him. She, Miss Rosa, was born in 1845, with her sister already seven years married and the mother of two children, and Miss Rosa born into her parents' middle age. Her mother must have been at least forty, and she died in that childbed, and Miss Rosa never forgave her father for it. And at a time when, granted that Miss Rosa merely mirrored her parents' attitude toward the son-in-law, the family wanted only peace and quiet, and probably did not expect and maybe did not even want another child. But she was born, at the price of her mother's life, and never to be permitted to forget it, and raised by the same spinster aunt who tried to force not only the elder sister's bridegroom, but the wedding too down the throat of a town which did not want it. Grown up in that closed masonry of females, to see in the fact of her own breathing not only the lone justification for the sacrifice of her mother's life, not only a living and walking reproach to her father, but a breathing indictment, ubiquitous and even transferable of the entire male principle, that principle which had left the aunt a virgin at thirty-five, above dust. So for the first sixteen years of her life she lived in that grim, tight little house with the father whom she hated without knowing it, that queer silent man whose only companion and friend seems to have been his conscience, and the only thing he cared about his reputation for probity among his fellow men, that man who was later to nail himself in his attic and starve to death, rather than look upon his native land in the throes of repelling an invading army, and the aunt who even ten years later was still taking revenge for the fiasco of Ellen's wedding by striking at the town, the human race, through any and all of its creatures, brother, nieces, nephew-in-law, herself and all, with the blind irrational fury of a shedden snake, who had taught Miss Rosa to look upon her sister as a woman who had vanished, not only out of the family and the house, but out of life, too, into an edifice like Bluebeard's, and there transmogrified into a mask, looking back with passive and hopeless grief upon the irrevocable world, held there not in durance, but in a kind of jeering suspension, by a man, his face the same which Mr. Coldfield now saw and had seen since that day when, with his future son-in-law for ostensible yoke-mate, but actually whip, Mr. Coldfield's conscience had set the brakes, and surrendering even his share of the cargo, he and the son-in-law had parted, who had entered hers and her family's life before she was born with the abruptness of a tornado, done irrevocable and incalculable damage, and gone on, a grim mausoleum air of Puritan righteousness and outraged female vindictiveness, in which Miss Rose's childhood— that aged and ancient and timeless absence of youth which consisted of a Cassandra-like listening beyond closed doors, of lurking in dim halls filled with that Presbyterian effluvium of lugubrious and vindictive anticipation, while she waited for the infancy and childhood with which nature had confounded and betrayed her, to overtake the precocity of convinced disapprobation regarding any and everything which could penetrate the walls of that house through the agency of any man, particularly her father, which the aunt seems to have invested her with at birth along with the swaddling clothes, was passed. Perhaps she saw in her father's death, in the resultant necessity upon her as not only an orphan but a pauper, to turn to her next of kin for food and shelter and protection and this kin the niece whom she had been asked to save. Perhaps she saw in this fate itself supplying her with the opportunity to observe her sister's dying request. Perhaps she even saw herself as an instrument of retribution, if not in herself an active instrument strong enough to cope with him, at least as a kind of passive symbol of inescapable reminding to rise bloodless and without dimension from the sacrificial stone of the marriage bed because until he came back from Virginia in sixty-six and found her living there with Judith and Clyte, yes, Clyte was his daughter too, Clytemnestra, he named her himself, he named them all himself, all his own get and all the get of his wild niggers after the country began to assimilate them. Miss Rosa didn't tell you that two of the niggers in the wagon that day were women? No, sir, Quentin said. Yes, two of them. 
and brought here neither by chance nor oversight. He saw to that, who had doubtless seen even further ahead than the two years it actually took him to build his house and show his good intentions to his neighbors, until they allowed him to mix his wild stock with their tame, since the difference in tongue between his niggers and theirs could have been a barrier only for a matter of weeks, or perhaps even days. He brought the two women deliberately. He probably chose them with the same care and shrewdness with which he chose the other livestock, the horses and mules and cattle which he bought later on. And he lived out there for almost five years before he had speak an acquaintance with any white woman in the county, just as he had no furniture in his house, and for the same reason, he had at the time nothing to exchange for it, them or her. Yes, he named Clytie as he named them all, the one before Clytie and Henry and Judith even, with that same robust and sardonic temerity, naming with his own mouth his own ironic fecundity of dragon's teeth which, with the two exceptions, were girls. Only I have always liked to believe that he intended to name her Cassandra, prompted by some pure dramatic economy not only to beget but to designate the presiding augur of his own disaster, and that he just got the name wrong through a mistake natural in a man who must have almost taught himself to read. When he returned home in sixty-six, she had not seen him a hundred times in her whole life. And what she saw then was just that ogre face of her childhood seen once and then repeated at intervals and on occasions which she could neither count nor recall, like the mask in Greek tragedy, interchangeable not only from scene to scene but from actor to actor, and behind which the events and occasions took place without chronology or sequence, and leaving her actually incapable of saying how many separate times she had seen him, for the reason that Weakin' or sleepin', the aunt had taught her to see nothing else. On those guarded and lugubrious and even formal occasions, when she and the aunt went out to Sutpen's Hundred to spend the day, and the aunt would order her to go and play with her nephew and niece exactly as the aunt might have ordered her to play a piece for company on the piano, she would not see him even at the dinner table, because the aunt would have arranged the visit to coincide with his absence and probably Miss Rosa would have tried to avoid meeting him even if he had been there. And on the four or five occasions during the year when Ellen would bring the children in to spend the day at her father's, the aunt, that strong, vindictive, consistent woman who seems to have been twice the man that Mr. Coldfield was, and who in very truth was not only Miss Rosa's mother but her father too, cast over these visits also, that same atmosphere of grim, embattled conspiracy and alliance against the two adversaries, one of whom, Mr. Coldfield, whether he could have held his own or not, had long since drawn in his pickets and dismantled his artillery and retired into the impregnable citadel of his passive rectitude, and the other, Sutpen, who probably could have engaged and even routed them, but who did not even know that he was an embattled foe, because he would not even come to the house to the noon meal. His reason may have been because of some delicacy for his father-in-law, the true reason for and beginning of the relationship between whom and himself neither the aunt nor Ellen nor Miss Rosa ever knew, which Sutpen was to divulge to but one man, and that under the pledge of confidence as long as Mr. Coldfield lived, out of regard for Mr. Coldfield's carefully nurtured name for immaculate morality and which your grandfather said Mr. Coldfield himself never divulged for the same reason. Or perhaps the reason was the one which Miss Rosa told you, and which the aunt gave her. But now, since he had got out of his father-in-law all which Mr. Coldfield possessed that Sutpen could have used or wanted, he, Sutpen, had neither the courage to face his father-in-law, nor the grace and decency to complete the ceremonial family group even four times a year. Or perhaps it was the reason which Sutpen gave himself, and which the aunt refused to believe because of that very fact, that he did not get to town every day, and when he did he preferred to spend it, he used the bar now, with the men who gathered each noon at the Holston house. That was the face which, when she saw it at all, was across his own dining table, the face of a foe who did not even know that it was embattled. She was ten now, and following the aunt's dereliction, Miss Rosa now kept her father's house as the aunt had done until the night the aunt climbed out the window and vanished. 
There was not only no one to make her try to play with her nephew and niece on those days formal and funereal. She did not even have to go out there and breathe the same air which he breathed, and where, even though absent, he still remained, lurked in what she called sardonic and watchful triumph. She went out to Sutpen's Hundred just once a year now, when, in their Sunday clothes, she and her father drove the twelve miles in a stout battered buggy behind the stout scrubby team to spend the day. It was now Mr. Coldfield who insisted on the visits, who had never gone out with them while the aunt was there, perhaps from a sense of duty, which was the reason he gave, and which in this case even the aunt would have believed, perhaps because it was not the true one, since doubtless even Miss Rosa would not have believed the true one which was that Mr. Coldfield wanted to see his grandchildren, regarding whom he was in a steadily increasing unease of that day when their father would tell the son at least of that old business between father and grandfather, which Mr. Coldfield was not sure yet that his son-in-law had never told. Though the aunt was gone, she still managed to bequeath and invoke upon each of these expeditions something of the old flavor of grim sortie more than ever now against a foe who did not know that he was at war. Because now that the aunt was gone, Ellen had reneged from that triumvirate of which Miss Rosa tried without realizing it to make two. Now she was completely alone and facing across the dinner table and without support now even from Ellen. At this time Ellen went through a complete metamorphosis, emerging into her next lustrum with the complete finality of actual rebirth. Facing across the table the foe who was not even aware that he sat there, not as host and brother-in-law, but as the second party to an armistice. He probably did not even look at her twice as compared with, weighed against his own family and children, the small slight child whose feet, even when she would be grown, would never quite reach the floor even from her own chairs, the ones which she would inherit, nor the ones, the objects, which she would accumulate as complement to and expression of individual character, as people do, as against Ellen, who, though small-boned also, was what is known as full-bodied, and who would have been if her life had not declined into a time when even men found little enough to eat and the end of her days had been without trouble, full-bodied indeed, not fat, just rounded and complete, the hair white, the eyes still, even young, even a faint bloom yet on what would be dew laps and not cheeks any longer, the small plump ringed unscarified hands folded in tranquil anticipation of the food, on the damask before the haviland beneath the candelabra which he had fetched to town years and years ago in wagons, to the astonished and affronted outrage of his fellow citizens. And against Judith, already taller than Ellen, and Henry, though not as tall for sixteen as Judith was for fourteen, yet given promise of some day standing eye to eye with his father. This creature, this face which hardly ever spoke during the meal, with eyes like, as you put it, pieces of coal pressed into soft dough, and prim hair of that peculiar mouse-like shade of hair on which the sun does not often shine, against Judith's and Henry's out-of-doors faces. Judith with her mother's hair and her father's eyes, and Henry with his hair halfway between his father's red and Ellen's black, and eyes of a bright dark hazel. This small body, with its air of curious and paradoxical awkwardness, like a costume borrowed at the last moment, and of necessity for a masquerade which she did not want to attend. That aura of a creature cloistered now by deliberate choice and still in the throes of enforced apprenticeship to, rather than voluntary or even acquiescent participation in, breathing. This bound maidservant to flesh and blood, waiting even now to escape it by writing a schoolgirl's poetry about the also dead. The face, the smallest face in company watching him across the table with still and curious and profound intensity, as though she actually had some intimation gained from that rapport with the fluid cradle of events, time, which she had acquired or cultivated by listening beyond closed doors, not to what she heard there, but by becoming supine and receptive, incapable of either discrimination or opinion or incredulity, to the pre-fever's temperature of disaster which makes soothsayers and sometimes makes them right, of the future catastrophe in which the ogre face of her childhood would apparently vanish so completely, 
that she would agree to marry the late owner of it. That may have been the last time she saw him, because they quit going out there. Mr. Coldfield quit. There had never been any day set for the visit. One morning he would merely appear at breakfast in the decent and heavy black coat in which he had been married, and had worn fifty-two times each year since, until Ellen married, and then fifty-three times a year, after the aunt deserted them until he put it on for good the day he climbed to the attic and nailed the door behind him and threw the hammer out the window and so died in it. Then Miss Rosa would retire and reappear in the formidable black or brown silk which the aunt had chosen for her years ago, and which she continued to wear on Sundays and occasions even after it was worn out, until the day when her father decided that the aunt would not return, and permitted Miss Rosa to use the clothing which the aunt had left in the house the night of her elopement. Then they would get into the buggy and depart.